Fall. Ja. Tango Master, yeah. Cool, thank you, yeah. Do a quick sound test, make sure you can hear me. All right, can you hear me then in Calgary? All right, great. So we can hear there, here and there. Well, getting pretty close to the end, huh? So we just got this testing thing to get out of the way, and then you're on your own. Well, with our help to do your projects, and then you're on your own. <laughs> cool. Um, I got. I have the pleasure of talking about feature testing with RSpec today. This is actually one of my favorite lectures. It's kind of, it's it's pretty fun for me, because um, we get to make these computers do the hard work for us, and all that testing that you've been doing up until this point, uh, you can start to see how that can translate into maybe something automated instead, something that's, uh, that fits into uh, to this category of uh, consistent, predictable, and, and that, that type of consistency and predictability gives you confidence in your testing. Uh, and when you have confidence in your testing, your software is working pretty well. That's what we're actually going after, right? We want to make sure that our software runs well, that we find issues before our users do. So feature testing is sort of... Um, Yesterday you did unit testing. Now we're going to talk about feature testing. This is how we act. Uh, one of the terms might be integration testing. This is how the different features actually work together. So rather than a unit test, which is really focused on one maybe function or class, uh, feature tests are uh, more long form testing. And uh, they would typically include actually testing the features, login, ordering, those types of things. That's what we're going to actually be doing today is testing the order flow of jungle um, from end to end. Before we get into that, we want to talk about 
uh, strategic testing in general. So how do you come up with a test strategy for your project? Uh, we'll talk about continuous integration and continuous deployment or continuous uh, delivery, which is this idea that if we can continuously test our code, every time we make a change, can we run it through some tests and then confirm that those tests pass? And if they pass, then that product might be good for deployment at that point. And so a continuous Im integration would be the process of testing the software every time you commit. And uh, continuous delivery is uh, perhaps having it automatically deploy that software every time those tests pass. The tools we're going to use today uh, are RSpec and Capybara. So RSpec you're familiar with. You've used it as a test runner so far. Capybara is, uh, apart from, I don't know, some people say, I've never seen one in real life. I don't know how they act in real life. Some people say you don't really want to be around them, uh, but they look adorable. Uh, so uh, hopefully we can use this software uh, to do some feature testing. This is what we're going to use to select elements on the page. Uh, if anyone who's done the work um, a little bit for, for tomorrow, this allows us to do things like uh, select certain buttons on the page, have them be clicked through a headless browser. Headless browser means a browser that we don't actually have an interface for but it still has a DOM, and if you have a DOM, then you can select elements in that DOM and manipulate it still. Capybara lets us do that. It's the, inter it's the piece of software within in, uh, that's built in Ruby to, to do that. So strategic testing, it's all about coming up with a plan to test your software, and there are lots of different uh, concepts that go into this. What we're really after, though, is um, or I guess what we have to be under understanding of is that we don't get all three of fast, cheap, and good. Testing costs money, and if you're not spending a lot on testing, it's probably not going to be great testing. Um, it takes a little while to write these things, so it might not be fast. Uh, but you get to kind of some combination of these, and, and really what you're after is a balance, because we, get it, we don't get the ideal, so a balance is the second best, right? Manual testing, that's what you've been doing so far, uh, except for maybe yesterday and maybe a little bit on the weekend, I'm not sure. Uh, but manual testing is, was done for TinyApp, it was done for Tweeter, it was done for Chatty, and it was uh, mostly done for Jungle. So this is just you opening up the app in your browser and filling in forms and clicking login and hopefully testing the bad cases as well as the good cases. But uh, as developers, we have a tendency just to test the things that we know and hope will work, especially as we're learning to code. We don't want to break things and we have to fix them, right? So I'd say for a few of those reasons, manual testing is quite biased. Uh, and so it might not be um, really good until we're good at it. And testing in general is a skill on its own that people can get very good at. And I've met some people that are very good at testing, and they think much different than we do. Um, so we have to work well with them, and we have to understand how they think and start thinking in that way when we're writing our software. This is kind of what I'm talking about. This is a joke, but it's uh, a pretty good one to illustrate uh, what a, a, a some, someone who's a professional QA person uh, or quality control or quality assurance would be some of the terms we'd use. Uh, a QA en engineer might be someone who is uh, experienced with testing and then also can write scripts because they have some software engineering. So here, uh, most people when they log in, they might just put their, their email address and their password. But what are some of the things that you could put in there that you think might break it? What unsupported characters? What happens when you put spaces? You know, that type of stuff. And so this is an example. Uh, we start with zero beers, we go one beer, whatever, and then 909, you know, outside the boundaries of the numbers that we might expect to, to fit. Let's try, let's try that. Let's try numbers that will not fit within 4.1 bil billion or whatever, which is the limit of a 32-bit integer, which if we know that, we can, we can test that. Uh, I don't know how you'd order a lizard, but maybe you just put in, put in stuff. And actually, there are tools that we can build uh, that I've used in the past. So my, my testing experience mostly comes from video games. And one of the things we would do is set up a piece of software that would randomly press controller buttons. It wouldn't actually press the controller, but it would send the same inputs uh, to, our, to our game. And you would basically get crashes overnight, because and, and you'd get to see a list of all the buttons that were pressed. And you could replay that through your UI and actually reproduce uh, bugs that way. So um, we're not good at this, but we want to get better at it. Code coverage is something we should talk about quickly. I don't find it to be uh, as important as maybe some people do. But what I'll say is um, code coverage is this concept. We can measure how much of our code is actually executed through our testing. 
Uh, and that was mostly automated testing that we do code coverage on. This is just a percentage uh, number that you know, something's tested 90%, something's tested 32%. And usually it just means this is how much code is being executed while we're testing, or what percentage of the code is being executed. Um, RCOV is the tool that we could use in Ruby to do this. Uh, and, but the main thing I want you to get out of this is that the target is project-based. If it's only 12%, but that is the most important 12% of your application, that can be okay. And you have to start somewhere. So what it's more about is choosing the right locations of your application to test the things that are business critical. That's We want to be making good decisions about where we spend our time testing. And then we can start to, over time, build up a good series of tests. But we always start with the most important uh, areas of our product. What this could look like, if we go to GitHub, well, I'll, I'll search for React on GitHub. Uh, and, oh, not, thanks, autocomplete. Killing me. All right. The reason I go here is it's a popular library, and any popular libraries might have some of these badges here. So, for example, we know that the license is MIT, it just at a glance, that's good. Uh, whenever we're choosing open source software, we have to choose one that, that has a license that supports the project that we're building. We can't just use any code that's out there uh, at, at, our, at our own will. We have to actually adhere to the licensing that comes with that code. MIT is quite permissive. I like to use the MIT. Anything under MIT or BSD are, are, are pretty good. Uh, you look at anything like GPL, uh, LGPL. Those are a little bit more um, in the spirit of open source, but it also means that you might have to open source your software as well if you're going to use theirs. So you just think about that. But these badges are good for surfacing some of that information. Tells us um, the version that is the latest on, on NPM. So it's saying that the latest version of React on NPM is 16.4.1. That's pretty useful information. Right? Other than ha rather than having to go see, normally how I would do that before is I might go up to my branch here and look at the tags and see here are all the tags that different releases of this software. So this is normally what I do. But this is way easier for me. I just Take a peek and see, oh yeah, good. The latest version, if I want to install the latest version, 16.4.1. I can do that. That's what we're talking about with coverage. Code coverage is 91% on this app. On this app. That's phenomenal. Uh, I mean, React should be covered that well. It's very popular. It's got a lot of backing, large company backing it. We, look at, we can click on this, and we should be able to look at some of the details on that and when this number has gone up and down. Why would the code coverage go up and down? Yeah, more code being added without tests. And then you have to catch up on those tests. And you can do that. I mean, you don't have to. But the idea is keep track of where you are. And if that number goes below what you're comfortable with, time to put some time into testing, right? Um, so this is a tool, I think, called Coveralls. I've never used it before. Um, but it helps us track this sort of information. You've also got, uh, obviously, it's open for PRs. So pull requests is what that means. So people are they're willing to take request, uh, pull requests and people's changes. But this is what we're actually talking about uh, as well today, is Circle CI. So Circle CI is an implementation of continuous integration. And it's saying that the tests are currently passing. So, uh, I would rec I mean, Circle CI is pretty good. You have to pay for it. I think it's probably $10 a month or something like that. But it gives you this interface here that every time someone does a pull request or, or a merge or uh, a commit, whatever criteria that they've set up, the test suite will be run. That 91% of the code will be executed every time a commit is made. And we'll get information pretty quickly as to whether or not that pull request caused a failure in the tests or not. And so if it did cause a failure in the test, then that is not a time to release a new version of React. right? And they know that, and they know that quickly, and they don't have to actually uh, spend a lot of their own time figuring that out. So um, this process is important for larger development teams. Uh, teams of two or three people can usually get away without it. As you start to scale past five, seven, ten, twelve people, and you're starting to get major check-ins check multiple times per day, this is very important. And I hope that you work at companies that believe that is true, because it makes software development much more efficient and, and, uh, and predictable, and, and you're comfortable with your code. OK, any questions about that so far? OK, are we more or less excited about testing? <laughs> I know it's a bit dry, but let's keep going. I put diamonds on it. All right, unit testing. These are some of the pros of unit testing. And I, you maybe have not 
recognize some of these yet in your one day of unit testing, that's okay. Uh, some of the things that I like to call out as being benefits, um, so encapsulation. Encapsulation means that uh, these tests are self-contained, and these are unit tests specifically, right? So unit tests are self-contained, that's the goal, that you have this function, it takes some inputs, and as long as the function has no side effects, it's an easy one to test. You give it these inputs, you expect these outputs. That's really a straightforward process. Um, unit tests run quickly for this reason. There's not a whole lot of uh, loading of, of code and stuff, so uh, unit tests run pretty quick, faster than you can manually test those functions yourself. Uh, regression. Anybody understand the concept of regression when it comes to testing? Okay. It's okay. It might be a new term. Uh, when it comes to testing, the concept of regression is when you have found a bug in your application and you fix that bug, that bug is no long, it does not go away. It may not long, no longer be in your software, but it still has to be in your memory or in your bug tracking software because you need to go and retest old bugs to make sure that they don't occur, occur anymore. This is one of the great things about unit testing is if you do good unit testing that maybe you find a bug and you didn't have a good test for it, you write a bug, you write a test that actually tests to make sure that bug doesn't come back, you've satisfied that regression requirement. We had, uh, at, at EA, we had massive teams doing QA, te teams of uh, 30 people on a game perhaps, but um, total testing teams of over 200 people. And those people were responsible for very specific areas of the game, and they had to every day go and retest bugs that they had, te had, had tested and been fixed before. And as the project goes on and you have more and more bugs that we've found and fixed, that means that they have to do more regression testing. Uh, I, I don't know if I could have done it, um, but these people were brilliant and didn't get paid, in, paid well enough. And we wouldn't have the games we did. Even, even, you know, I mean, we talk a lot about these games having lots of bugs, but if you've seen a game at Alpha, it is nothing like it is when it's at release, maybe unless it's like Jurassic Park or one of those notoriously poorly released games, right? Nowadays, we get to patch games after, after they've been released. You might, down, you might do something called a day one patch, which means there's, there's a month between when your, your game, you do your gold master, and uh, when the game is actually on the shelves. In that time, you're spending time fixing all the bugs that you didn't, that, that you didn't have to fix to pass uh, all the um, certifications from Microsoft and Sony, for example. So you send out a patch on day one, uh, and that has all the stuff that you, that you fixed in the month since the game uh, was kind of locked down. So uh, this process, yeah, huge, uh, huge importance, especially on larger projects. And it gives us confidence. This is important. Um, gives us confidence to release our software. Right? We don't make money off software that's not released, so we need confidence that our software runs well, and if we have that, we can release it and, and make some money off of it. That's different, th different than reliability and stability for me, because I think that fits into a different category. Whereas confidence is about releasing our software to the public, I believe that reliability and stability fits into a different category. So why would it be important for our software to be reliable and stable? Not uh, apart from when it gets out to our users. What happens if you break master? Can you continue to work in the way that you should be able to continue to work? No, you have to fix master first and then you can proceed, right? Yeah. So reliability and stability is all about making sure that the development team is unhindered by broken software. It's, in, it's incredibly crucial that this happens. Smaller teams, you get away with it. Larger teams, teams I've been on of maybe 100 engineers, uh, that build breaks. We get a message in our email saying build has gone red. It's not green because we've got continuous integration. Our version control locks down. No one can commit from that point on, uh, which means no new changes are getting in there. And the, the priority for the entire team is to make sure that thing is fixed. The person responsible for the break likely is the one to fix it, but there's also someone who is the build cop. They're the person who is making sure that that person is held accountable for that. And that person who broke it becomes the next build cop. Things like that have to be built into the culture to make sure that we do not, we, we hit our deadlines. Reliability and stability fits into that category. I think it's probably the most important thing on here. Cool? Don't want to scare anyone. Unit testing. There are some cons as well. Maybe I should have done red and blue the other way. I don't know. I just like the colors so much. Uh, so unit testing is expensive um, because it requires software developers to write unit tests. We try and automate some of that stuff. But for the most part, you have to think and go make good decisions. And that costs uh, companies money. But that's OK, because we make that money, right? So um, 
if we can get companies to buy into the cost savings and the value that's provided by tests, then this, expen this, this expense is relative and actually is an okay one. Um, maintenance is another thing that comes with unit testing. Remember we, uh, you know, if you, you can imagine if you write some code and then write a test and then you decide to change your feature and that code has to change, then maybe your test has to change as well. And so these things don't, you don't just write them and then forget about them forever. They might, they might have to have maintenance just like the rest of your code. Uh, but that's okay. I mean, that's, that's software development. So, you know, testing, who thinks it's difficult? Yeah, a little bit, right? Like, to, to put yourself into that. But it's about a mindset, right? The code is very similar and actually can be quite nice to write because of the um, sort of the domain-specific languages we use and how it, some of it reads more like the English language. It should do something and, you know, Ruby is, is kind of that way as well. So I think that uh, apart from that, putting yourself in the mindset is a difficult thing to do and think about all of those things that need to be tested, but that's why we have people that are really good at that and that's why we want to learn from those people. And so if you get an opportunity to work with QA people, pay attention to how they approach these, these uh, testing software. Super beneficial to learn. And that makes testing less difficult because you're in the right mindset now. You know, testing is also very specific, right? Test functions. But what we want to do might maybe is through manual testing is Log in as a user, add a cart product to the cart, go to the cart, click the pay button, fill in our credit card information, you know, complete the uh, order, and then go to a page that says thank you for your order. Manually testing that is relatively easy for us, except when we have to do it over and over and over and over again. So if we understand that that's a good test, that's a good test to write, we write the test for that, and then we can run it quickly over and over and over again. Um, whereas unit testing is specific, it, it doesn't really solve that problem. So really, the specificity is the only real problem that we're solving with feature and integration testing today. Uh, you get m most of these features from integration testing as well. I would say that confidence, reliability, and stability would be two things for sure. Regression is another one. Not necessarily speed. The speed, you're going to notice things slow down a little bit, uh, and I'll try to explain why that is. It's not really uh, encapsulated with feature testing. So feature testing has some of these pros, some of these cons. Um, but it does solve this specificity problem. So it simulates user interaction. So what I just talked about could be a manual test and it could also be an automated, automated test. We'll simulate that user action of the user filling in forms, clicking buttons, advancing to pages, paying for things, and then reading the page and confirming that what should be on there is on there. We'll go and we'll talk a little bit about this. This is where it's going to end for continuous integration. I just want you to get excited about what's possible when you start to have some uh, automated testing. Um, so this is an automated process where a as you develop, you keep developing you and then you commit into source control. That's usually a merge maybe into master and a push up to a remote repo somewhere. Uh, that remote repo will trigger an event. I don't know if you've realized this, but with Git you can actually set up something called hooks. And hooks are triggers that certain things have happened in the version control software. So when you do a push to a remote repo, that remote repo can listen for that push, and when it receives that push, could run a script. That script could be another node application if you want. Anything, really. Could be a program that you download uh, that automatically, or it, I guess it could be a script that runs your build process, npm install, and then it does a migrate, and then it does a run the app uh, and, or in, in, you know, in the environment that we're in. Automatically, it runs the tests for you. And then it does all those integration tests, and that's hooked up to maybe a mailer system where once you get that report back, it sends it out to the whole team and says this build passed green, or more likely you'll only get an email when uh, the build breaks, when something has not passed, and everyone will get an email saying it was these three tests that did not pass, or something like that, right? So we want early information about that, yes? Uh, in Heroku, you can put the tests. That makes sense. I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I've never done any testing with Heroku. What I'm talking about here might be a, a system set up specifically for that, or you're using Circle CI, for example, integrated with Git, um, paying a little bit of money. Okay. Andrew, see you, Andrew. Andrew's leaving from Calgary. All right. Yeah, so um, I don't know how it would work with Heroku. We'd have to look into that specifically. If you show me, I can definitely talk to you about that. Um, and, and normally this is a process that you would set up through a third party uh, using it. Uh, I'll get to these tools. It kind of looks like this. Uh, Jenkins is free, I think written in Java. 
Travis CI, uh, I think that might be free as well. Circle CI, um, maybe free for open source, but then you pay for a commercial product, but it's only like $10 a month or something like that. So really reasonable for the amount of, for the, for the, for the user interface and the, and the um, when you pay for products, they tend to get better and better and better um, quickly. Open source products, sometimes they, they you know, get good and then something, um, someone takes that open source project, builds a commercial product on top of it and then sells it and now that one becomes the one, to, you know, you see that happening. So lots of different options. These are four of them, but there's probably more like 12 out there. Uh, Bamboo is a paid one and uh, you, you just hook this up to Git and it will be able to clone your repo, build your product and then and run your tests for you. So if you get continuous integration set up, then you can think start thinking about continuous uh, delivery or continuous deployment. It really depends who you talk to. Uh, that is kind of which term they use. Um, but I'm just going to tell you about the idea behind them. If continuous integration passes, if those tests pass, and you have a high enough con uh, confidence level, then you can either do a manual or an automatic push to production, and your app is now live out to that user. So those changes can automatically make it out to, the, to your customers. Um, this is a lot of when you heard about Facebook early on. I don't know if they still do this. Um, sometimes scale take, makes this a lot harder. So there's like a sort of a bell curve in it where um, a, a few changes, you don't really need it. Uh, and then you're doing lots and lots of changes, small changes, so it's better to automate that process. And then teams get so big and there's massive big changes that it goes back down in terms of um, uh, being a good process or an easy process to do. So I would suggest that if you're not confident in your testing, you might have a, a different approach that still is pretty close and as automated as, as you can get to, which is Continuous integration will automatically deploy to a staging server, which is basically a replica of production that's not visible by the public. That's something you can see, inter a, a server you can see internally, uh, that maybe the product owner uh, or any of the developers or the owner of the company or whatever, they have access to this and they can try the latest version of the app out at any point that they want. But then once someone has, maybe it's your internal QA team that uses the staging uh, environment, and then it, once they are happy uh, with that and think that it, they have the confidence they can release it, then you do a manual push to production. I think this is probably more common with uh, software engineering teams at this point. Okay, we talked about the tools, no problem. Any questions about the CI, CD stuff? No, okay. So RSpec is the Ruby testing tool. It's just a test runner. So it can be used for all different types of testing, uh, which is pretty cool because you just point at a different, maybe different directories and it runs different types of tests for you. Capybara is the integration test framework. I mentioned already that uh, Capybara lets us hook up to the headless browser, which is allowing us to manipulate the DOM and simulate that user interaction on a website. Uh, I figure there are no questions. Hands would have gone up. You're pretty open with those. Good. So we will move on to the example that I have today. And before we do that, I just need to quickly mention that I have gone over uh, to the schedule here and I have done this already, which is what you will need to do to do the same stuff as me, which is this capybara and poltergeist setup assignment. Right? So if you haven't done that, the stuff I'm doing will not work. I've done this already. Uh, I formatted my computer a couple weeks ago, which means that I've had to set up my environment again. Uh, which means that I try and do the lecture, uh, not, not the lecture, but all the technical stuff the night before. I may have missed some things, so hopefully nothing comes up from that. But I did, uh, I was able to run my tests and I installed Phantom and did all this stuff, made sure it worked. So um, I have uh, this project here and I think I sent out the notes already. So if you want to uh, follow a, a, along, um, it's under, it's under my, my notes, uh, RSpec notes. On All right, uh, so we talked about strategic testing, continuous integration, delivery, good, RSpec and caveat. This is where we're actually going to, yeah, start actually writing some, some code. So who uh, has noticed that when I do Rails G, I get a list of generators, I believe. Yeah, good, thank you. So there it is. I get a list of these generators. And here are the, the generators for Rails. 
And here's one for something called Money Rails, so that must be from a gem. Here's a bunch of R spec generators, right? So these generators, they get added as we add gems. Right? These generator, generators are not just, they're not just one set of generators that we have. So one of the generators that gets added when you set this stuff up is this R spec feature generator. This is an integration test uh, generator. So I can do Rails, generate R spec feature orders, or I'm just going to give it the name of sort of the feature that I want to uh, test. And I think in this case, what I mentioned was login, order, and, and check that, that confirmation. So orders is a, is a pretty good name for this test. Hit it. Not rail. Rails, let's do that. So I generate uh, this feature spec, and it's giving me this file now inside of the spec features orders uh, spec file here. Just some template. <laughs> Go down to spec features orders, right? So this is what I'm given at the beginning. And it looks a little bit different than the test that you generated yesterday for unit tests. So for example, instead of describe, it's sort of this rspec.feature. And I think down here we have to um, we can give it we can give it like a, a name here, something like visitor orders a product. So visitor orders a product is sort of the feature that I want to uh, test. Um, what we're going to notice here is that I actually am adding something here called JS true. It's another parameter on this RSpec feature method, right? So RSpec feature here uh, is a that kind of has this block thing, right? takes in this parameter, it also takes in the type parameter, and we need to say that JS is enabled. JS needs to be enabled because we need to use this headless browser. So is anyone not clear on what a headless browser is? We're good on that, right? Okay. So the headless browser we're using is called PhantomJS, and we just need to make sure that that's enabled here for these tests, because every time we bring these tests up, it has to bring up this software that's the headless browser. That takes time. It actually takes a few seconds, it seems. And so we, we don't want the tests that don't need that browser to, to load the JavaScript driver uh, that we've set up in that previous assignment. So I'll just add that here as an option. JS is enabled. And um, I, I could run this. So I'm just going to do that through, uh, through Vim here. I'm just saying R, I'm going to run the RSpec command. And it's come here, and it says that there's a, a pending a pending test that needs to be written. And that's just because it has that not yet implemented stuff. So I'll get rid of that pending thing here. And I'll start to set up my scenario. So instead of uh, it is what you were using yesterday, here we're using scenario. Again, these are just different generators, uh, different um, frameworks that are um, being used here. So once you write one test, then it, you just, then you, it's easy to know it's scenario and feature, right? So I don't know, I don't have a good reason or a good answer for why this is different than what you were doing yesterday, uh, specifically, other than someone made a different decision on their naming. But it still means the same thing. You've got a grouping of a bunch of tests, and then you've got each test defined. In this case, it's a scenario, right? So the scenario is that they, uh, they complete an order while being logged in. That's, that's what I want to test right now in my scenario. I want to make sure that the user can log in, and then when they make an order, that, they, uh, that it sends the email to, or not necessarily that it sends the email, but it says that, that thank you for your order with their email address. That's the goal here. And uh, you know, that's all I need to do here for, oops, for that one. Um, so let me show you uh, a little bit about the capybara. I think that's probably the right next move. Capybara testing. We could look for that. Here's the Team Capybara website. That guy is uh, that that capybara. I like that one. This API documentation is not really nice to look at, but it. I think this it's this panel here that makes it really scary. I don't know who agrees with me on that. And just like, I have to actually know the structure of this software 
to find the class, and that might be very useful for some people. Um, I don't know this software well enough, but they've got this table of contents over here. This is where we want to spend our time. This is actually not so bad. Um, it talks about using Capybara with our spec. We've already provided that assignment that helps you set, set this stuff up. Um, you've got these drivers here. Uh, so Poltergeist is the uh, driver we're using. It's the thing. It's the Ruby li library that understands how to talk to the PhantomJS uh, JavaScript library. Then you've got the DSL. What does DSL stand for? Yes, thank you both. Yes, uh, domain specific language. And this is um, where we can start to kind of look at how we would navigate around our, our, the site that we're testing here. So we can say we want to visit and then give it a, p a path. Or we can actually say we want to visit and then use one of our Ruby helper prefix paths that we have, right? People are familiar with, with where this comes from, I hope. If not, you can always bring that up in size. Rake routes. So this prefix over here, this one is root path. This is products underscore path, product underscore path, add underscore item underscore cart underscore path. This is we, what we can use to look up what paths we can use. And this is sort of how we can use them, right? So we do that in Rails. We also can do it in our tests to go places if we want. Or you can just give it a path. Yeah. When you go into that path, you can pass in a parameter like that, right? Um, when you, so when you go in, when you're using this path, you can pass in a parameter. Yes, because this is the post comments path. And the post comments path likely requires a parameter like this, right? Yeah. So the pro this product underscore path would likely take in the ID of a product, right? Because otherwise it doesn't know what product we're talking about. But the products underscore path likely doesn't have a parameter because it doesn't need a parameter to know what products it's talking about. It's all of the products, so it just can make that assumption. Does that make, does that make sense? So some of them will take parameters, but it's because we need to specify this value through a function rather than through the address, right? Um, yeah, so for most of these, it looks like they don't have. Oh, wait, don't they get passed automatically though? Because uh, the, the, the thing that you are at, right? Because then you just go around ID. Uh, with this one? Or with this? With that. Well, with this, what we do is we pass it a post and it can figure out what it needs from it. You'll see some of this, yeah, the main thing here is that this is a single post, and so we need to tell it which post we're actually talking about to generate that path, right? Yeah, yeah. It has to have that context, otherwise it won't know where to go. And then here it says we can expect that that page now has the current path that matches where we told it to go, right? So um, this can be, yeah, very useful for testing, for checking pages that we're on. Um, I know there's a test uh, in, in today's work that, uh, that this might be useful for you. Okay. Other things we might be able to do, clicking links and buttons, right? We find, a, we find some link on the page. How would we target a, a link on the page? Let's say it's an A, a tag. If there's an ID, we could use that. If there's a class, if it has a tag name, anything we're doing in jQuery to select things, we can think about doing that here as well. It's the same kind of an idea. We can use these types of style of selectors to grab elements on the page. And then um, if they're buttons, then we could have the action actually triggered for them. Um, we can fill in forms. right? We can choose and un check and uncheck checkboxes. We can check to see if there is certain content on the page. We can see if the page has certain content or certain CSS that's on that page. We can search for things. We can find them using selectors. And when we find a button, we can click on that button. Okay. We can scope things. So we can say that we have this form, that within this form, we want to uh, access th this element. Or within this iframe, we'll, we, wanna, we can do this stuff only within this frame. So it limits the search space, makes things a bit faster, makes it a little bit easier to write the, the code for it. Cool. So this is what we'd use as our, as our reference for the th types of things we'd want to do. And uh, the first thing I'm going to do here is visit the root page. And that could be root path. Oops. 
don't really need that since there's no, you know, there's no parameter. I don't need to could visit the root path. Let's see what that does. When I run this, Something's weird here. I want to make sure that. Okay. One example, one pass. It's okay. I didn't have any, I didn't put anything called expect in there, right? So it's not possible for that test to fail. And I, I think it went to that page, but I have, I don't really know for sure. So the, what I want to do is think about how would I, debug this feature, how would I, um, how would I figure out whether or not what I asked the headless browser, which I can't see, how, does, how do I check that, that it went where it wanted to go? And we can actually use something called save screenshot to do that. And I can give that screenshot a name, I'll call it orders.png. Okay. So now when I run this, and now I need to go and find the directory this would be in, it's going to be in your jungle folder under temp, under capybara, here's orders. That to me looks like the root path. That looks like the root page, right? So I'm using this screenshot uh, as a debugging process. It's also possible, I've, uh, we've, in the past, I've uh, written scripts for games where, um, you know the screens where you choose the team and it shows the logo and it keeps cycling the logo every time you press down? Well, we would always have to make sure those logos were up to date. And so as the game went on, it's possible a team changed their logo, so we'd have to replace their logo maybe right, with a new one. Uh, or maybe we didn't have a logo for a new team that was added to the database. And so you'd get this green box that said missing asset. Okay, well, I could write a script that actually automatically cycled through every single team, and once it, once it went to the next team, it saved a screenshot, maybe with the name of the team, uh, or, and the idea of the team into a folder. And then what a QA tester has to do is just go and look at all the pictures and see, are there any green boxes in here? And that might be a lot easier than actually having to manually cycle through that, right? So save screenshot could be useful for some testing. I find that uh, at this stage, you'll probably just use it for um, debugging your tests while you're building them and then remove the screenshots after afterwards. Cool? So very useful. And um, I've now confirmed that I've gone to the root path. And so what I want to do is think about, OK, I'm at the root path here. I need to first log in as a user. So maybe it's not the root path that I want to go to. Maybe it's actually the login path. OK, so I'd go back to my test. And I'd say that instead of root path, we'll go to, ooh, I don't remember what it's called. I could also, I guess, rake routes and see. OK, good. There is a login uh, path, so I could use that. Visit the login path. And then run our spec again. I'll wait for this image to update. And now we're actually on the login path, right? So that's pretty useful. Going to. Now, now I need to think, well, what, what's next? And so I go back to my browser, and I think, what's the next thing that I would do here? Target. Tar yes, I need to target this thing, because I need to put in a valid user login. But that actually reminds me that I don't know what user I should be logging in as, and what, does my, what users are in my database right now. It's a test database. There are no users. Yeah, so I have to create a user before I run this test. And so I go back and I think about that. And I go and do my before each do end stuff, right? I think it's like that. Let me just confirm in my notes. Again, I don't write a lot of Ruby tests. I, the, as much as I write tests, it's, it's this lecture. So sometimes I have to go back and just kind of peek at this and say, yeah, OK, no, that was right. It was before, uh, before and then the symbol each, which is uh, pretty, pretty, that makes sense. OK, so before each, what I want to do is create a user. And so I can do that with 
user dot create, right? And what parameters do I give a user? First name, last name. First name, okay. Is that is that? Name, okay. So this is where we need to kind of go back and think. I've got it in my notes here, but what I, what I would do is I would probably look it up in my model or, or, or even a controller that's doing this already, and I would just take a peek at how it's being done in my app, and then I would t then I could just take that and say, okay, well, I can do the same thing here. I mean, um, I can I can fill in this information. Let's do that. Uh, go back. So I'll just do that instead. Okay. So I've got this user that's being created. We all know what this exclamation mark does. Definitely know. I worked with you yesterday. I know Jordan. Everybody else know what this exclamation mark does? If there's an error, it will raise the exception. Whereas if I don't have the exclamation mark, it will not raise an exception. If I if I had an error. Um, in this case, I'm not testing the creation of a user. Uh, it's okay. I would I kind of want it to raise an error if I've made a mistake there because that helps me out. Um, so I think exclamation mark is okay there. Uh, I'm going to create a user called first user first at user.com. That stuff all looks good to me. And so now. Um, I should be I should be able to to log in as that user. Right. Sorry. I didn't I didn't think so. My password has to be a number. Did anyone implement that? Did anyone validate that? No, I don't. Yeah, I think. Okay. Okay. <laughs> no problem. I mean, your passwords can be, I guess, whatever you want. Um, all numbers is okay as long as it's long enough numbers, right? Um, so, so here, this should create my user for me. It's hard to s test that because when I when I run this, it's going to add the user, and then when the test is done, it's going to remove the, it's going to clear my database again. So it's hard to test this out. But um, I could, uh, you know, I can. One way I can test it out is just to to try and see. If I can log in with this this user, right? so yeah, yeah, the yeah the idea should be right. Um, yeah, and and I guess with database cleaner you could set it up so the sequences are reset as well, if you wanted to. Yeah, although. Um, I would not want to write any code that relied on IDs being a specific, other than being unique. I don't care what they are, okay. right? Like I don't care if they start at one all the time. Yeah. Other than maybe for an OCD sort of, like, like because I look at my database and it has to start at one, and and but then records cannot be deleted, and uh, I can never, you know, change what, right? Like other than that, I don't see a reason why I would care, yeah. e even that they're in a certain order necessarily. It's just that they have to be unique. So, um, yeah, so I guess here we'll test this out. I kind of go in and um, this is where we bring up the inspector, right? We need to take a, take a peek at this and see, like, how would I target this form? And so we need to look at, we need to look at this and see that there's actually a form here. It doesn't have any other sort of, like, good identifiers in terms of, it is a child of the main container class. That might be one way we could select it specifically. But I don't. Th there's no other forms on this page, so I'm okay with just targeting it by the tag name at this point. I want to make this easy on myself. So the way that I do that is um, it's within form. So we looked at that. Uh, at that documentation, and there was this concept of scoping. So I'm going to scope to that form and say that within this form, I'm going to fill in the input field with the ID email, and I'm going to fill in the ID, the input field with the ID password, and I'm going to fill it with this data here. And then after that's done, I'm going to click the button that's a part of that form. This is how we would write this test. So within the form tag, do this stuff, and then fill in something with the ID of, and this is where we have to go back and really look at this and say, um, right here, we do. We've got an ID on this one called email, right? And then down here, I've got one called password. 
Um, this is this is so this thing here. I believe that this is the this thing you're seeing. If I disabled last pass, see this? Yeah. Then this little image would no longer be shown in my input fields. This is something that an extension has added to this page. This extension is injecting this ba style background image onto my input field. If you wrote an extension, you could do this too if you want. This is how they work, right? That you're, if you have extensions installed in your browser, it's possible it is manipulating your DOM for you, right? That's all this is. It's a base64 encoded image. What is base64 encoded? It's sort of this format here where we can say that all of the data necessary for this image is actually encoded as this string here. So we can easily put it on, uh, embed it in a web, uh, a web element like this. Um, and you can, uh, I mean, base64 encoding, you can search for that and see how to do it on the web. You can take an image, convert it into base64, and then use it as text, just like they've done um, in, in this example here. Yeah. And so sometimes, I mean, this, this could be useful for, for lots of things. I've used this uh, to encode an image in, in, in that's used in JavaScript or whatever, right? Like, it's, it's fine. You can, not massive images, but small images. Like, this one's such a small image that it makes sense to do it this way, rather than uh, have someone actually load up a, uh, Every time we load an image, we do a request, right? So every, if we have a thousand really small images, we do a thousand requests. It'd be a lot nicer to have one request that had a thousand little images in it that we could pull the data out. That might be a better way to do it. So um, yeah, I kind of on a tangent there. So what we were really looking for was input ID email so that we can say that we find the input with the email ID and we're going to fill it with the first at user.com email address. I'm just going to make sure that that works before I go any farther. Uh, and I do that through my screenshot. Robots, right? So first at user.com has been inserted in here. You could, yeah. You, you can, um, so that, yeah, so the question is, uh, for Calgary, is why don't we just do fill in ID email because ID email is unique. So we could, so we, it should, it should be only one of them. Um, I wanted to show you scoping. I want to show scoping because sh scoping is an important thing. And we got lucky on this page. But um, let's say that there is no ID on that uh, element and there's two things that have a name. Uh, that, that have the, the name that is the same. Because you can also target form inputs based on the name. You can target based on the placeholder value, which you'll see later on. There's lots of things we can target a form based on. An ID is unique, but the other ones are not. So with scoping, we can actually use, we can actually be specific to say it's this form and this, the name of this element in this form, whereas this other form, you know, maybe may we say within form dot a, and within form.b, and that would be a way to separate those things on, on more complicated pages. Yeah, it's going through um, through. Uh, Polter Poltergeist is the is the one that our spec uh, w Kathy Bear and uses to integrate with Phantom JS. Phantom JS is actually the JavaScript headless browser, okay. or the Node app that's in that's the headless browser. So The capybara gives us this language. Okay. And poltergeist allows us to hook up a JavaScript. Um, but also the JavaScript headless browser that we're interacting with. Poltergeist does that interaction. Capybara uses it as the driver to do the interaction with that browser. There are a few other ones. We, we, if we see uh, the documentation for capybara, there's this section up here called um, uh, drivers. And there's one rack test, Selenium, Capybara, WebKit, and Poltergeist. So we're using Poltergeist, but you could actually interact with a different uh, okay. library. So then Phantom JS is interacting with Poltergeist, and Poltergeist is helping with Phantom JS. Um, Capybara gives us the language. Yeah. Capybara uses Poltergeist to interact with Phantom JS because you need a bridge yeah. between Ruby and JavaScript. Okay. Because we're yeah, because uh, Phantom JS is a JavaScript application. 
Poltergeist is the interface between Capybara and that JavaScript app. And Capybara gives us this language like visit and within and save screenshot and all. That's all Capybara. Um, but then Capybara abstracts away that, that headless browser. If we use Selenium instead, we would still write the same language and we would just, uh, it would, it Capybara would know how to interact with this other browser that we were using instead, this other, this other browser library. I've not, um, I haven't done any of this testing in, in Ruby before. Um, I've done a little bit in the, in, the ga in the gaming stuff, we wrote our own systems. One of the, one of the systems we had it was called Juice, another one. Uh, so we had our own tool that interacted with the game through controller inputs and that type of stuff. Um, maybe mouse input or whatever it is. Uh, so I've, I've, n I've had not had an opportunity to do it. I will do it as soon as one, someone's willing to pay me to set this up for them. I, will, I would love to do it. Um, and because I, I really think it's powerful, it's hard to convince companies to do it when they're small and or if they if they don't really understand the benefit of it. But you only have to do a few projects uh, until you realize that you get benefit from this, and then they're a lot more willing to pay for that. And uh, it's a it's a it's a learning process. Yeah, a lot of them don't. Some of them have uh, some of the big ones. They start to um, provide sort of on-site or support and they charge for the support. So if, let's say an open source library gets popular enough and there's not a big company backing it, that company could spin up a support and um, teaching uh, portion that is for, for that, that they do pay for. And so a company who uses this open source library pays this other, this, the open source group to come and, or, or I guess this commercial entity, to come and help them use that open source pro project better. That's actually a pretty common model. If you've ever heard of PhoneGap, for example, it was purchased by Adobe eventually, but it was one of these early uh, JavaScript projects that would allow you to write JavaScript but deploy on the mobile phone uh, as, as, a, as an application. And that was free to use. You could, you could use it commercially, you could do whatever you wanted, but then they, had, they built up a team of people that would go to different companies consulting them on how to use it well. Yeah. Um, React is backed by Facebook, so they've got a lot of money, and they've just th and and they they are built on open source software like MySQL and PHP, and they have to give back. We we rely on these companies to give back to the open source community. It's there's no other way, right? Yeah. Um, the companies that are that are making money off this open source software have to be contributing back to it. This is one thing that uh, we'll, we'll take a break in a second. Um, we'll we'll come back and and see how this. Uh, now that we know that this is this is working, um, you brought up a good, good point. If you npm install something and you find a bug in that library, it might be up to you to fix it and send it back to the, send the fix back to them. Right? That's the responsibility we have as developers who are using other people the software other people are providing to us. We don't get to complain that the software has bugs because we have the ability to fix those bugs, and it just means spending the time to learn that software. It's not free. It's open source. Well, how we pay for it is by having to learn it well enough to be comfortable to use it and be responsible for it. Someone who writes an open source app uh, pr project, they are not responsible for fix fixing your app. Maybe you can pay them to do it, but there, there's no responsibility to you on that. And I see that that, <coughs> I've, I've seen people where that's not necessarily the way they think. And, uh, and I want to make sure that we're not falling into that trap. And I want to make sure that people, that the companies that are using this software, no matter how big or small they are, they're doing even a little bit to contribute back. They're not saying, oh, we'll just copy and paste that code and use the part that, that we need and not actually benefit that project. How, how would that thing survive? That's how they survive, though, is that people give their time, maybe not their money, but their time to continue ha making these things work. All right, enough ranting. Um, we'll take a break. Uh, if anyone. Uh, has any questions, come let me know. We'll be back in about five minutes or ten minutes.
back on. All right, so when we left off, we, oh, got to make sure I turn this on. That's been split screen. All right. I think there might be one person watching. I don't know. It's like my Twitch channel. Um, and that one person's me. <laughs> okay, so when we left off, uh, we had looked at this screenshot, and sure enough, it filled in this form. What are some of the, what were some of the cons of of, um, of unit testing or testing in general? Right. So we had. Go back to this. Expensive. expensive is one of them. Yeah, good. So expensive is mostly just the time it takes. And yeah. okay, it's the next one. Maintenance. Maintenance. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about maintenance. How ma maintenance tip tip tends to come from things being coupled, right? Like tightly coupled. So what we've done here is we've looked at a form with an idea of email. What happens if the UI developer decides that email is no longer a good ID and they change it? Test breaks. Yeah. Maintenance, right? What happens if someone decides that this name isn't something they no longer want to use? What happens to the test? Right. right. So we want to start thinking about, as we're writing this test, how could we maybe um, decouple things a little bit better? Or actually, um, rather than this sort of uh, soft coupling here, when I say coupling, I mean like two things, you know, two things tied together. And this email is tied to this area of the code right here. And so what I might do in this scenario is just say, well, I need to have a user no matter what. And so I'll create that user here as an instance variable. And instead of writing it a second time, I'll just say user.name here. And so it doesn't matter what this name, or, or sorry, not email, my mistake, user.email here. So it doesn't really matter what this email is. If someone changed it, it's no problem. I still will log in with that email. That is me trying to create maybe a really hard, strong coupling that, that uh, is, is using a reference rather than um, a copied piece of information. Right? So we want to be thinking about things like that while writing these tests. We can fill in ID password with user.password as well. Uh, I guess they don't have a password because I don't think they have a password, do they? Let's check that out. Thank you. Pair programming is awesome. I wish I had more friends. Um, so let's check, check this out. Let's see if. Okay, so now it's actually adding my username and a password, and it's six characters, and I'm hoping that that is correct, right? That's the one I'd expect to be in there. Good. Um, the last thing I need to do, once I've logged in and filled this out, well, wait a second, I need to log into this uh, first at user.com. I think I actually use the same things. Yep. So now when I, when I did that, once I put the right information in, I clicked that button, right? So this is the last thing that we want to do here. In, within this form, we also want to target the button. Um, and the button has a name. It's submit. So we can just give that as the parameter. Uh, the capybara is pretty good at figuring out what you, what you mean. So and we'll run this. And what are we looking for now? What would we expect our screenshot to look like? Logged in as a user and uh, showing this product page, right? Because that also re it redirects us back to this page after we've logged in. And now it says that I'm logged in as first at user.com. So this is good. We've, we've gotten so far, we've gotten to this point. What's the next thing I want to do? Add an item. Add an item, yeah, because I need to be able to, I need to be able to add an item. So in order to add an item, I need to create a product, right? So we, we go back to here and we say, I'm going to create a category, uh, category.create. 
And this category, I believe it only has a name, is that right? You, you've been working in this a bit more than me, I think it's, yeah, okay. And then category.products.create. What do I need to put in for product that I create? I know this will actually just be at product. Although I don't know if I actually need it, so whatever. I'm going to go leave this. Uh, what do I need to put in here? Name. Okay, let's do that. Cool shirt. So name. Quantity. Uh, let's say, I don't know, one of them. Price. Uh, and I think I need a description, maybe. A really cool shirt. And I also need a image, right? What image do I put in? Yeah, and so it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I can just I could put a, like a string in here if I wanted called TS. I could leave that out. The point is, I don't really care if an image loads or not. It's a headless browser, and no one's really paying attention. And I'm not testing to see whether or not product images show up. That's not what my my test is all about. So this is a way that we reduce the expense by just not not messing with the things that don't matter. I'm making the decision now that I don't need to spend a lot of time figuring out a good image to load. And if I'm going to write a test for that, then I could spend more time on that. And then maybe you know reuse that stuff that I write later on. So uh, we want to we want to take shortcuts where we can, and shortcuts that don't affect the test. Yeah. Because they have a name, they already use you know category dot product. Yeah. Be able to fetch, um, you know, for that category of products, which is none right now you created. That's right. So um, I create a category first, and then because every product needs a category, um, I can create it through the association, which is what I'm doing here. I'm saying category dot products dot create. Um, so that's why I don't have to put the category ID here. It, it knows what it is because it is the category that I created up here. Now, um, now what I should see is when I run this and I take my screenshot, I should actually have that product listed there on that page uh, with the, the cool shirt and the, there it is, right? No image, no big deal. Now what would I do with this? When you install Capybara, yeah. you, uh, so you always have a temp folder in Rails. Temp folder, yeah. Okay, but then some th this might change. In, in this case, Capybara would have been added when you add the Capybara uh, gem, okay. and then in there are your screenshots. I've named mine orders.png, so it keeps replacing it. If you don't give it a name, if you just do save screenshot, it's going to create a, a timestamped one every time. But, but what, what is the temp file? Is it like temp directory? It's every Rails project. It's temp files. Yeah, like this screenshot is not necessarily a file that we want to keep, right? Okay, yeah. um, this cache stuff, not necessarily want stuff we want to keep. Uh, temp stuff for sessions and sockets. I mean, they just you put stuff in there that you don't intend on keeping or that could be removed, right? Okay. Without without concern. Yeah. Uh, okay, so we've confirmed that we're on that page, uh, we, which actually looks like this. And now, what do I need to do? Add the product. And so this is a pretty good way to do it. And click on that button, add. And when I do that, we notice up here that my cart says one now. Okay. So I need to do the same thing through my script. The way that I do that is I, I, I need to target this add button. But there are many add buttons, right? So I start looking here and I see um, this add button has the text add, but so do many things. So that would actually select a whole bunch of things, right? I know there's only one, okay? But let's let's not think. Let's not assume that there's only one. Let's assume that there could be more products on the page for our test, and that by adding more products to that test uh, suite, we don't break all these tests that thought there was only going to be one, right? This is about again anticipating maintenance. So we need to make that good that good decision. Uh, what about selecting this product here? And then within that product, we choose the Add button. To me, that's a, a safer way to do it. And our test doesn't care how, it shouldn't care how many products there are, but it also shouldn't care which product we add. That shouldn't be a concern to us at this point. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually just going to select the first article that has the class product. 
that's how I'm going to target it. I'm going to say, just find the first thing on the page that matches this, this condition. First article dot product. That's what I want to select. And then inside there, I'm going to find a link. Find link is something that I can do. I can say that I want to find, and, and this is going to be scoped on that product that I found. So I'm, I find the first article, and within there, I find a link called add. So that's how it's actually going to find just one item, is by being a little bit more specific this way. Find the link called add, and then click that button. Right. spec. Check my temp directory. There's Capybara. Orders. And it doesn't look different, but I know it is because the cart now has one item. OK. How can I make it from this page with my added item to the cart so that I could actually start to try and pay for this thing? I, yeah, I could rake routes. That's a good. So bringing up what we, what we did earlier, we rake routes and we look and we see that there is a cart path. So we could just visit that path directly. I think that's a good way to do it. Because I'm not testing whether or not clicking on the, the cart button, because this is another way to do it. I could click on this thing. And if I was testing that, maybe I would actually find and, and click that. But to me, writing visit uh, cart path is just way faster, because I don't even have to look at the DOM. And chances are the path isn't going to change, but maybe that button does. So. At, at this point, after I've added an item to the cart, I will visit the cart path. Run our spec. Make sure that the order is updated, or that that order pay, uh, image is updated. And here we go. So now we're on the cart page. This is where we are in our test right now. And what I need to do is be able to click on this Pay With Card button. When I do that, it brings this thing up, right? So let's look at this. This is provided to us by Stripe. When things are provided by other companies, we don't control when they change. Since I started doing this lecture, I've had to fix issues resulting from Stripe changing the way that their code works. It's just part of the cost, yeah. This is like a pseudo um, CSS selector kind of. Um, yeah, this is a, this is a uh, CSS um, targeting thing. So before, uh, it might be on this one here, this, uh, this section cart show, they might actually have something that happens you know, before it, some CSS that's applied before it. So it's a concept I can't get into right now because it'll take us away from the testing. Um, but take a look. It's, just, it's a, There's also an after one as well. It's act, to me, this act, it looks like this is actually doing a clear fix. This after is doing a clear fix. So um, I don't know what bef yeah. So it looks like before and after sets the content. Yeah, this, this looks more like a, some sort of a clear fix hack, yeah. Chances are it's because this is written in Bootstrap, I bet, and, and Bootstrap has stuff like that still. Flexbox would make anything. If we upgrade to like Bootstrap 4, Flexbox probably would have solved this problem. Because I think Bootstrap 4 uses Flexbox instead. Yeah. All right. Um, so I'm, I'm targeting this thing here, this Pay With Card button. And I can see that this button has a very distinct class uh, called Stripe Button L. And that's, so that's a pretty good way to name it. Although if they ever changed uh, that name or whatever, then we would have to update our, our thing. Um, I'm going to target it that way. I'm going to say that I want to find uh, that button. Oops. I want to find, and I, I like to do first because I don't know. It's, I don't think I'll get multiple back that way, right? Pretty confident I won't. So we say it's the first button with stripe. I think that's, I think that's what I did. Yeah, first stripe uh, button dot stripe uh, stripe button element. Stripe dash button. L, and then we just, that's a button, so I'm going to click it. 
And I R spec again. I'm still learning this stuff. I want to make sure that, that did what I want, what I expected it to do. Okay, what's wrong with this? To wait for the animation to complete, maybe uh, for Stripe's data to download. Maybe that's what this this thing that we're seeing here is. There is an asynchronous behavior uh, occurring when we click this thing. It doesn't it doesn't come up immediately. It takes a little bit of time. Maybe it loads some data and then fades in. So this is something we are going to have to deal with. Um, it's not that big of a deal. I can confirm that that's the case by taking by adding something called sleep, and I'll sleep it for five seconds, and then I'll take the screenshot and see if, see if this thing shows up within five seconds or not. Now, we only use sleep for debugging, because otherwise it just adds time to our tests. We don't want to do that. But it's a good way for us to figure out whether or not it's a timing issue or not, and how much time is actually needed. Five seconds definitely gave it enough time to fully show up, right? What's kind of cool, though, is that uh, Capybara has a little bit of a built-in timeout. So with all of these things like first and find and fill in and within and expect, they will all keep trying for two seconds. And if that after two seconds they can't find the thing they were looking for, then that will, that will come back as I did not find the thing and then the test fails, right? So um, we should be able to actually still target those elements, those uh, those field elements in this page, this, uh, we should still be able to target these things as long as they are on the DOM within two seconds, then we should be able to target them fine. How do we target this? Well, here's the input field. And we're looking for something that would be unique enough and pretty explanatory as to what it means. Input, not good enough. There's multiple inputs. Type, telephone. I mean, this is a credit card, so all of a sudden I'm not going to just trust that, right? That's, that's, a, that's a workaround of some sort. Uh, class, field set, input, talk, text box, control. I don't know. I mean, that could, there could be multiple of those. What about this ID here? IDs are unique, right? OK. When is this ID? Change what? Who who decides what the ID is? Yes, yeah, Stripe does. So I I don't know. Maybe it changes every time I load this page. Sorry. Yes, it's, it's it's the placeholder here. It's this one here is is the best option to me because although ID is usually a real, a good option, I don't know the details on this ID and I don't know that Stripe doesn't change it every time I load this page. I guess I could confirm those things. But then I'm still uncomfortable. What if they have some sort of a timer that they change them on? I have no idea, right? Like, I don't know what their implementation for this is, so I do not trust it. So therefore, placeholder card number, it's easy to fix if it breaks. And it also tells me what it means. And uh, it's a possible selector. So I need to say that within, I'm up here, within this iframe called Stripe Checkout app, I think it's within frame, maybe. Let's check, double check. Within frame, yep, Stripe checkout app, cool. Do, and now I'm only looking inside that frame. So I need to fill in placeholder. And then it was, uh, it was card number with a lowercase n. With, and what do I put in here? What value? Okay, four one 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 one. Okay, my pre I actually prefer the uh, the other one, which is four two four two, because I can do. I don't know. Doesn't really matter. You just need one that'll work. One two three four. One two three four. One two three four. I think that's right. And then, um, I mean, let's just double check to make sure that my scoping works. So I'm going to test this out, and then I can add the other. Three thing, two things that I need, which is the expiration date and the CVC, right? Okay. 
Look, it's not even faded in completely, but it was able to find that element. As soon as it was on the stage, it kept looking. And as soon as it was there, as soon as it was in the DOM, it was able to find it. As soon as it found it, it was able to fill it in. And then it took the screenshot immediately after that. So I think that two seconds timeout is, is plenty for us. I'm going to go and take a peek at maybe some of these other items here. This one's called MMYY. This one's called CVC. So I'm going to follow that pattern and just card number is going to be, instead we'll do MM year year. And what's the, what do we have to put in for this? Anything, uh, anything in the future, right? One, two, three, four, that would be, that would be fine here, I think. One, two, three. Here we need to say. Okay. Okay, sweet. And so, do we know that it, like 34, that works? Yeah. So you've confirmed that. Because yeah. looking at this, I would not make that. I would not make that assumption. I would have to test it, right? Good. Right. Okay. Because, um, well, it's good that it works, and it's good that you tested it, right? Because um, I, I would say credit cards. My credit card expires maybe every five years, right? So do the does does Stripe say? Well, wait a second. Fifteen years is way more than any credit card would ever last for. So we're just gonna, but they don't. No, you have to go about fifty years. Okay. Do that. But there is a limit. There is. Okay. So how long is this app gonna exist for? Who knows, right? So um, this is okay. This would get, this would buy you a lot of time. But what I'm gonna show you is another consideration we make in the in an effort to um, predict or, or to like predictively maintain this app, right? Let's say, because uh, it only has to be sometime in the future, then um, January works as long as it's next year, right? And what we could do is, instead of that, we could say it'll be January of, oops, no, we have to do hash here, right? So I'm not doing JavaScript. Oh, come on. Come on, hold up. I'm really going to miss my escape key if I have to upgrade my MacBook. I use it to switch modes in Vim. Um, I th maybe I'll have to switch over to Caps Lock. I don't know. OK. So um, what I want to do here is I actually want to calculate the date. I want to figure out what today is. I want to figure out what these, this year is. And I just want to add one to it. Because I think that's going to be, that'll work forever, right? As long as, well, hopefully. So the way that I can do that is uh, just with a little bit of Ruby code, right? I can say that. I can grab today's, uh, t the date today, and from that I can grab the year, and then I can add one to it. And so now when I run this, thank you. So now when I run this, I should see 119 in there, and then if we ran this again next year in January, it should be 120 and all that, right? So this is great because my concern would be. Oh, I've, I didn't, what, obviously, what's the problem here, right? Copy, paste, yeah, cool. So we need to, this is CVC, right? Okay, so um, this kind of, this is where I tell the stories about how you start your job the first day, you can go in bright and early, and they've told you, you you're going to commit your first day, doesn't matter what it is, it's got to be something, though. And so you go and you think, I'm going to make it, I'm going I'm to do something, I'm going to commit, and then uh, all the integration tests run. And it just so happened that it was January 1st of 2019 that you ran these tests. So you're the first one to run these tests. Your change is the first one that caused these tests to run. And so the build breaks, and you get this email, and your first day on the job, your build is, the build is broken. And you're like, wait a second, why is that? I didn't have anything, I didn't do anything to do with this form of this area. And it was just because the test was bad, and you get blamed for it, right? So we want to avoid anyone else having that embarrassment by making sure that we're avoiding situations like that through um, things like dates that change without our control, right? That's what that's, that's what that's meant to highlight. May or may not be, you know, putting 34 in there is fine, but I wanted to show you an example of how we have to think when we write these to avoid test breaking not because of code we wrote but because of environment around us changing. Uh, I think I'll just try and click the button called pay. 
because I'm a little bit behind on time. Yeah, click button pay, so that was a good guess. And now what do we expect to happen when we take this screenshot? Takes us to that orders page, right? Yeah, so uh, I'm going to tell you right now that uh, this isn't going to work. And does anyone want to guess why before it's done? takes time. Yeah, it's one of those things that takes time again. If anyone noticed, when they click that stripe button, it does a nice little animation. It does a cool, like, convert to green button kind of circle. Like, it's really nice, and it's a great user experience, but it really messes with our testing. So here I am sitting on this page. I've got all my stuff filled in. I think I clicked the button, and uh, it has not happened yet. So the way that we, s we, again, the way we figure that out is we say sleep five or something like that. Should I just do one? Thank you. Nice work. OK. Yeah. <laughs> OK, so I waited five seconds, and now it's at this page. So I, I, that click button works well. But um, I don't know. I guess if that takes more than two seconds, which is my timeout for for any for finding things on the page, then when it comes to expect, and I think it's just expect page to have content. Yeah, thank you for your order. Um, it'll look like this. Yeah, it is. So once this, I think once this block is complete, so I click pay, it'll wait, it'll, it'll go at least two seconds to find a button called pay. But once that's happened, um, there's nothing else that's triggered that timeout again. So sleep five would be the next amount of time. But then after sleep five, it would wait up to two seconds to see whether or not it found this content on the page or not. So seven seconds between pay and um, Between executing bef between starting to look okay, for that seconds, yeah. no it's 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 at least five seconds uh -huh. but it could be between zero and two seconds because the timeout is, is a timeout it actually isn't I'm gonna wait two seconds till this happens it's I'm going to wait at least two sec uh, I'm gonna wait for two seconds and if it hasn't happened by then I stop but if it happens then I don't wait anymore right that's why the timeout is better than a sleep sleeps are, are hard-coded to that amount of time timeouts are at most this amount of time. Does that make sense? Oh, but so timeouts are... Um, minimum zero seconds, maximum two seconds. Yeah, yeah. Sleeps are minimum five seconds, maximum five seconds, if you said to sleep for five seconds. So that, so that when, you, when, when they look for the button pay, once they press pay, it's a two second... No. No, no, no they, they, will wait, they will wait for five... If they can't find it within five seconds, okay. they will keep looking, or two seconds, they will keep looking. But after two seconds, they stop looking. Um, Technically, if, you use time. If, if it doesn't find the thing, then yeah, yeah. yeah. It, then it would take two seconds. It would stop looking. It would sleep for five seconds. That would be yeah. seven seconds total. Yeah. 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 So then here, I want to put this expect because expect has a timeout as well. It'll it'll look for this content for uh, for five seconds or for sorry for two seconds um, before it gives up. So I'm going to actually just switch this over to uh, oops, I did that again at uh, user. Dot email. I think that's right. Good. And now I'll R spec. Yeah. Yeah. It's not much different than normal JavaScript code that you've been writing. Okay. First failure, right? This is because I finally added an expect here, and it says that we expect the page that we're on to say thank you for your order. But actually, uh, and here it says, thank you for your order first. But it can't find that text in here. And that's because we're still on that page. So that timeout is not enough. Five sec or two seconds is not long enough for that Stripe thing to close. How long does that thing take? How 
How long does this take? Ready? Click. One, two, three, four, five. something like that, right? So we need to up that timeout to now work with Stripe. Okay. So I'm going to. Uh, uh, there's a file that I can modify. It's in the spec directory under, I think, Rails helpers. And down here, uh, you were in here already, doing, or you will be doing your Poltergeist setup, right? So I also want a Capybara, uh, oops, Capybappy, uh, Capybara setting. And I think it's like max default wait time or something, but I can check my notes. That's, it's this setting here. Oh, it's default max wait time, okay? This is where you overwrite that two seconds. That would like the entire that would be zero. It doesn't. Remember, it's yeah. now it's minimum zero and maximum ten. That's why it's important to use the timeout, not the sleep. So here, we're saying now we're going to give you ten seconds to look for things. And yes, if things aren't found, it does increase the time the test takes to run, but uh, it, it gives us room for these this type of stripe behavior. So. Um, oh, and uh, here, what I mentioned about Stripe breaking some things for me, here's a, an example of that. Uh, when I started doing this lecture, I did not need to do this. Uh, pull, I did not need to set the TLS version, but then um, I, we don't are going to get into details on what, what that is, but basically Stripe said we do not support lower versions of the secure protocol we use. And so, but my, my, my web, uh, PhantomJS, even though Chrome, it worked fine when I did it manually and clicked and went. PhantomJS was not using the right version of the secure library, and so Stripe rejected it. So I had to uh, s do a setting on that, on that PhantomJS library <coughs> to tell it to use that version, so Stripe accepted it in the test environment. So, so stuff like that has happened to me in the past. It was frustrating when I, because I found out during the lecture, and I couldn't finish the lecture because it was uh, hindering me. Um, it took like 10 minutes afterwards, but of course that's... Um, no, I, like I did it. That's what that setting does. Is it, it's, it sets it to use the newer version. Um, it's just that by default, PhantomJS was choosing the older, choosing to use the older version. All right. So now I've updated that. I've up that. Uh, let's do R spec. See if now ten seconds is enough for us to pass this test to confirm that that text is on the page. All right. It passed. That means that it is all good, and it means that this screenshot should have what we expect on it, because the screenshot did not happen until the expect was met. Uh, the negation of which? Expect to have, or expect not to have? Um, expect not to have where? So the, the, the idea here is that I want to get to this page and then I want to check to see if it has certain content or certain CSS on it, right? I can, I, can, I can do other stuff. I can test to make sure that when I'm on the login page it says login, but that's not really what I'm testing. The goal is for me to check to see if I'm on this page, and there's a few ways to do that, right? One, I check to see, because here I also want to see it says thank you for your order with my email address. That was one of the requirements of the application. Yeah. So this is also like an acceptance test. Does the application... Uh, fulfill all of the requirements. We can use testing to, d to determine that. So um, I don't need to save the screenshot anymore. What I want to show you now is a little bit of test-driven development, right? Because we're kind of, this is a hybrid approach. One, we've got the feature already and we write a test against it, but we could also now write a test and then fix that feature using that test. And that's test-driven development. So what would happen if my scenario instead was uh, that a they complete an order without logging in. They complete an order without who tested this? Did anyone test yeah. the completion? Okay, and what happened when you tested it? Did it work? It worked, okay. Um, but did you have to fix it? It just worked. Uh, no, he said, I don't know, somewhere. 
Yeah, yeah there was. But it was because I added like this authorized authentication function. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is a little bit different ver version of Jungle. It's only like a very minimum. It's minimum. It's I took the exact same project you started with, but I only added like two or three the, the login feature basically. Um, so it might be a little bit different, but my app will not work if I try and log in if I try an, uh, an order without a login. So if I do that here, let's say that I log out and then I go here and I add a product and I go to that product in the cart and I pay. Right, it doesn't work. And it, it doesn't work here because I don't have a current user logged in and I'm trying to grab email off of a nil value, right? So um, I, I, could, I decided that I was going to write this test. N do I know if it works or not? It doesn't really matter, but if I write a test that tests that feature, then I'll find out pretty quickly and then I can actually keep running the test until it goes green to fix the problem. Test-driven development, right? Here we go. Uh, how would I write this test? Yeah, let's, do, let's use the code we've written already because it's very similar. So uh, that's, the reason it keeps typing K like that is because if, if I'm in insert mode and I hold down K to go up, which is the way that I, like J, K, L, they, they move around. Uh, just, I know, it's frustrating. I don't use the arrows. I, yeah, I, I, I don't use the arrows. It's, then I have to leave home room. Why do I want to do that? So um, the first thing, I'm, I'm not going to go to the login page, right? I don't need to do that for this test. And I don't need to fill in that login form. But I do need to start at the root and then do all of this stuff, right? So what I could do here is actually define a new function, um, add product and checkout. And here it does all those things for me, right? And so when I visit, I add product, oops, uh, yeah, and check out. And then I don't, yeah, I don't need to do all this. I can get rid of it. Oh, that's the login stuff. Never mind. I log in. Don't want to get rid of that. There. I log, I visit the login page, and then I do the add product and check out stuff. So does my test still pass? I know it takes a little while, but the cool thing about this, you don't really have to. I can check my email right now. I can drink some water. I can eat a snack. I can go to the washroom, and I don't have to be at the computer while that ran. And if it's two or three minutes, that's not a, like, think about all the other things you can be doing while that's happening. Sure, here in 10 seconds, it's hard, me to, hard for me to context switch like that. But it's, I feel like even though it takes a little while to run the test, it's not wasted time like it is when I have to uh, mouse and, yeah, right. So that test still ran. And so now what I want to do is I want to say that uh, I expect that I get a thank you for your order. And um, this is test-driven development. So we get to choose right now what this is going to say. Uh, and I'm going to say, you know, just thank you for your order instead, right? So uh, then I also need to visit the root path. I think, yeah, root path. And I need to add product and check out. OK, so I've, I think like that's pretty much this test now, right? And it took me a lot less time to write, which is fantastic. Who likes to be on their phone, right? Like I'm not doing anything on that computer. It's just doing all the work for me. Just to you know, I can check. I can check the tweets. I can check the instas. How many? How many? Yeah. How many instas? How many instas can I check in the time it takes for me to break my app? Look at this. So test-driven development, right? Because we need to recognize this is not a broken test. This is broken code. There's a difference. You get errors sometimes because your test has failed, and in this case, we got an error because our app failed. What does this say? It says that in the orders controller RB file on line. Uh, line 40 in the create order function, we're trying to look up email on a nil class. OK. That's what it said here, too. But I didn't have to do all this stuff manually, right? So this and this 
same. No method error, no method error, right? Like this gives you a representation, it's just not in the browser. So I'm going to, uh, I think it was the orders, um, it's the orders controller. So I can just modify this file now. And where, what I'm looking for was like line 40, somewhere around here. And there it is, current user dot email. Okay, that's a problem, right? If current user is nil, um, then we want to maybe just do s empty string. And otherwise, we'll use current user dot email. Something like this, right? This might not be the best solution for the app. I'm not really worried about the solution right now. What I'm worried about is showing you like test-driven development. So, but this should solve the problem, right? In the case that there is no user, it'll create an order without an email. How that works in the rest of the software, yeah, I don't know, but um, I've done this before. So now we want to run our test again, our spec. And we want to see, does that fix that problem or not? First test pass, good. All right. It fixed the problem. But we got another problem, right? This is a different error. It's not a no method error this time. It's an action view template error. So that's even, that's not just uh, sort of like controller errors or, uh, this is like, um, this is in the actual view layer that it's able to test. So it's the same issue, right? Like. I'm trying to use current user, and I don't have a user logged in, so I'm getting a nil value, and I'm trying to grab email on it. So I would take a look here before I leave this. I'm going to look at, this is views orders show herb, and it's line eight. So maybe I'll switch over to that. It would be uh, views, and then orders show. And down here it says, thank you for your order. Yeah, of course, that's not going to work. So we say, if current, or let's say, I guess we could, unless, unless current user is nil, else, no. No, in JavaScript you do not equal, right? Yeah, unless it's, I mean this is idiomatic Ruby, right? So like, you know, Unless it's nil, I'm going to use it, and, and then otherwise I'll just put thank you for your order, which is what I made. This is this is what my test expects to be there, so I have to make the decision now that this is what that's going to say. And if I change my test, then this has to change, or vice versa. Uh, I don't indent. I don't indent my templates like it's HTML because it messes my HTML up. So imagine if I did this indent, and the templates are removed. These are double indented now, right? <laughs> so I made I've made the decision. Uh, I've made the decision that in my templates I just I kind of just keep yeah it happens that way. I don't know. Up to you, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I, I I do indent, but I'm so uh, I'm <laughs> I'm so compulsive about it that I worry more about the HTML that's generated than the actual source code. <laughs> I don't know what, what's wrong with me. Um, all right, let's try this out. Our spec. I like you to challenge me though. That's fine. I tell you to. I tell people to indent properly, and if it looks like I'm not, I want to know that. <sighs> Green, so good. Okay. I didn't even have to open the browser to test that. I was able to do test. I was able to write the test, and I was able to fix the code until it satisfied the test. It's like I have shivers right now. It's fun. <laughs> okay, um, that is test-driven development and R spec and Ruby and make sure that I didn't lose anything here. Uh, oh yeah, check this out. Here's a reference Capybara cheat sheet. You could probably find other ones too if you want. It's a little bit nicer way to find the cool stuff you can do with Capybara. Uh, it's in the notes. It's a link in the notes. Um, uh, Mocha and Chai are the tools we'd use in JavaScript to do a lot of the same things. Um, Chai, uh, JS, it has something called, uh, well, it has plugins, and these plugins 
are ways for us to interact with, uh, do different types of testing. So let's say all we want to do is test our express endpoints, right? So what we want to do is find something in here that has to do with uh, HTTP. So HTTP, here we go, HTTP. There's a Chai HTTP library. And when we use this Chai HTTP library, it allows us to do cool things like, um, where's the expects down here? Yeah, make a request. The, the request is put on me, you send this data. When it ends, we can expect it to come back with a 200. That would be maybe a way we do a test for that, right? So these chai, this Chai assertion library has a whole bunch of these plugins. And the type of testing you want to do is what dictates which plugins you use for that. Uh, Mocha is the runner, the test runner that keeps track of how many tests have been run, how many have passed, how many have failed. That's a callback, right? This is a callback, yep, to this end and change method. Awesome. Uh, any, any questions? We're good? OK, now are we more excited about testing? You don't have to be. It's OK. But you know, I wish you all well in your jobs. <laughs> uh, that's, that's it for me. Um, I don't think I have any more lectures with you, because I'm away next week. I'm going to Bowen Island to uh